Hi all, I'm Jacob Haller, and my pronouns are he and him. I'm a co-host of the Love You Like Crazy podcast, which is about young adult fiction and has been going on since 2015. I've been collecting resources to share with people who are thinking about starting their own podcasts, and so I recently decided to try to talk to some independent podcasters I admire about their experiences and what they've learned. Today I'm talking to Rose Eveleth, who is a producer, host, reporter, writer, and podcaster. She started the Flash Forward podcast in 2015 and recently launched a new podcast named Advice For and From the Future. If you're not familiar with Flash Forward, it explores different futures through interviews, scripted fiction, and research, and is always thoughtful and entertaining. It's one of my favorite podcasts. Um, so, Rose, is there anything I, I missed that we should talk no. about? No, that's great. That was a very lovely and kind introduction. My pronouns are she, her, and you covered everything. Oh, great. Um, so how did you get into podcasting? Yeah, so I thought I would be a scientist. Uh, I grew up, my parents are both scientists. Um, I sort of idolized Jane Goodall. I went to college, got a degree in genetics, was like, I will be a scientist. I was very lucky in undergrad to um, actually work in a lab um, and kind of see what science is like and sort of realized that perhaps science, the doing of science was not my skill set or interest. Um, but I didn't really know what else to do. The idea of being a journalist was not something that was on my radar. Um, I thought of journalists as people who, you know, break political news or sort of are in a newsroom in this sort of very intense way that didn't appeal to me. But I actually had an advisor who um, recommended a program at NYU. There's a science journalism program specifically about science at NYU. And so I wound up sort of on a whim applying to that and got a Got in uh, by the skin of my teeth. I was actually waitlisted. <laughs> Did not technically get in at first. Um, but uh, while I was there at that program, I had to learn everything about journalism, right? I, had, I didn't know anything at all. Um, and I didn't really know what kind of journalism I wanted to do. A lot of the other people in my program, it's a really small program. There's about 15 people every year. Um, and a lot of them came in knowing, like, I want to write magazine features or I want to be on TV and be a TV correspondent. I had no idea. I, was, I didn't like I just had no idea. So I tried everything. Um, and so one of the things I tried was making radio or podcasts and um, wound up uh, sort of commandeering an hour slot at uh, the WNYU station, um, which was great because I had to make an hour long science show every week that absolutely no one listened to, which was wonderful training ground, right? Because like, I mean, they're so bad. They're terrible episodes. But I learned a ton about how to kind of make a show um, and kind of got really interested in podcasts, radio, making things in sound. Um, I took a course while at NYU from a really great producer named Derek John, who's now at Slate. Um, and he was really lovely and sort of got me started in many ways. And then from there, I became an intern at Radiolab, which is sort of one of the science podcasts out there. I'm sure many people have heard of it. Um, and that was sort of my main introduction. It was sort of a, I'll try everything and see what sticks. And podcasting is what stuck. Cool. So, um, did you have like specific goals when you were getting started with, well, was Flash for Forward your first podcast? I should ask that. My, it was my first podcast that I really sort of created and owned and kind of generated from the ground up. You know, I worked on a lot of other people's podcasts. Um, obviously, I, I worked at Radio Lab as an intern. I helped make other shows for other people. Um, back then, there was a science podcast from the New York Times, um, and I managed to kind of talk my way into being the producer for that show. Um, and so I had worked on lots of other shows. I uh, worked on a couple of pilots um, for NPR around sports, none of which they picked up because they don't really care about, about sports very much. <laughs> um, but I thought they were good show ideas. Um, and so I had kind of worked on a lot of people's shows that weren't my own. Flash Forward was really kind of the first, well, that's not quite true. The WNYU show, um, it was called Doppler Effect, and it was kind of very much um, a show that, you know, sort of existed but didn't exist in that way that like college radio stations are. Um, and so I kind of helped design that. And then I kind of helped kind of reincarnate the uh, podcast for the NYU program that I went to. We had a 
podcast, the Science Line podcast, and sort of got a taste of what it was like to develop a show idea. But those were all very um, just kind of haphazard in many ways. They were great learning experiences, but they weren't mine. They weren't, they didn't have a clear vision necessarily. Flash Forward was the first show that I sort of pitched from the ground up and really developed into its own thing on my own. Gotcha. Um, And so did you have specific kind of goals in mind for it? Or was it more of a like, let's try this and see what where it goes thing. Yeah, not really. You know, I it, it feels, and you know this, 2015 podcasting feels like a totally different universe compared to today. Like it just sort of felt like you could try stuff and in a way that I think it's harder now, which we can talk about at some point if you want to. But basically, you know, I was um, working on all these other shows and um, a friend of mine, Annalie Newitz, who used to run uh, IO9 and Gizmodo, came to me and they were like, hey, you know, we're thinking about starting a podcast. Do you have any ideas? And of course, I had this huge running list of podcast ideas that, you know, I would sort of write to myself. And the one that I was most excited about was this one. But I pitched them a couple of ideas. And Annalie also was like, this is the one that's exciting and fun. And so I made the first season of the show for Gizmodo. So the first season of the show used to be called Meanwhile in the Future. Um, and so the first season was there. And then, you know, after that, they sort of a lot of things changed there. Annalie left, other people left. And so I sort of took the show independent from there. Um And so that first season was really just kind of a beta test in many ways to see, like, does this work? Does this make sense? Will people listen to it? You know, can I make it? You know, I had these ideas in my head of how to blend, you know, fiction and journalism and whatever. But it's totally possible that, you know, sometimes you try something and it doesn't work, you know. Um, So that first season, I didn't have a ton of goals. I was really just kind of trying to make 23 episodes, which is what my contract was for, and make sure that they were, you know, good, in my opinion. Um, And that was really it. Uh, The goals kind of came later. (laughs) Were you using your own equipment at that point or? um, Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, Gizmodo didn't have a podcast studio. There was no sort of capability. I think now more and more outlets have like a little podcast studio sort of built into their office spaces. That was not the case in 2015. Uh, You know, it was really sort of early on. So I did everything on my own. I did all my own production, all my own recording. I kind of just sent them, you know, the like final cut basically. And if they had notes, they would send me notes and I would make some changes. But that was pretty much it. Mm -hmm. So did you... I mean, do you remember what kind of equipment you were using and did that change over time? Yeah, I was using a really cheap, I actually probably still have it. I'm a hoarder of technology in many ways. I have like every cable that has ever come with any device that Mm -hmm. I've ever used for some reason, just in case, you know, you never know. Um, So I actually have it. It's a really old Ederol uh, like, you know, Roland Ederol, very inexpensive recorder that I would use. And actually, I split the cost of buying it with a friend of mine because I was a very broke freelancer. Like, I did mm-hmm. not have money to be buying equipment. Um, I did all of the interviews over the phone. So I just sort of recorded phone interviews um, for that first season or you know, connected with people on Skype and recorded that way. Um, and then, yeah, recorded myself on this like tiny little handheld, not very good microphone. <laughs> um, actually didn't buy like a real microphone until season three, like halfway through season three of the show um, because I couldn't afford to. <laughs> so, you know, I don't know. I think that in many ways, um, people get really hung up on microphones and tech and kind of like, what are you using? And do you have to buy this? And I get a lot of emails from people asking me, I want to start a podcast, but I need to buy this. What microphone should I buy? And I'm like, it doesn't matter that much. Like you can get so in the weeds on mics and what sounds good and what doesn't sound good. And obviously there is a point at which you need to be able to understand what people are saying and all that stuff. But I mean, the earliest episodes of Nightville were recorded on like not even a blue yeti like a way worse version of that mic and like so many people started shows and still start shows that they don't have to sound like perfect npr quality as long as the idea is good and people connect with what you're doing i think people get a little too hung up sometimes on like which microphone to purchase before they even have like a good show idea yeah i mean i listen to a ton of kind of indie podcasts uh and a lot of them the sound is I mean, the sound quality is not necessarily that great, but the concept is there. The personalities are there. And I think, you know, more important than having a good microphone is just making sure that you're like leveling things and stuff like that so that the listening experience for someone isn't like, 
super loud, super quiet, super loud, super quiet. That's the thing that drives me like as a listener. I don't really care if the mic is not great or if, you know, it's a little scratchy or if it's a phone call that you've recorded. But if like the levels are just all over the place, that's the part where I start to be like, okay, I can't listen to this. And that doesn't require a fancy microphone. That just requires you going through and like looking at your waveforms and making sure that like you are within the like, you know, the right range. That's basically free. So just do that. (laughs) Yeah. Um, so, so you use the handheld recorder. Uh, do you record directly into a computer now, or no? I still record into. I actually am currently recording into a Zoom H5. It's oh. not the fanciest mic in the world, but it does the job. And then this is a Shotgun Rode mic, and this is what I use for everything. Um, you know, I people always are like, "Oh, a shotgun mic," you know, X, whatever. It works fine. Again, like I'm not a tech head in many ways. I am a technology reporter. So like I know a lot about technology. I can tell you how these microphones work, but I don't actually care that much about like the specific which mic you use, which mic you don't use. I will say that Roman Mars also uses this exact microphone. So I feel somewhat vindicated (laughs) that this is the one that I have. But it was literally on sale on Amazon a couple of years ago. And I, I was like, oh, I've heard of that mic. I will buy it. And that was it. That was the extent of the thought process some people like and if, if you're into mics that's totally cool and like you can nerd out and that's great and you probably sound awesome it's just like not the thing that i spend my time and brain space thinking about yeah i've tried a few different mics and the truth is like in this day and age they all sound pretty good so I mean, even like, you know, when I interview people now, what I ask people to do is record their end on their smartphone, mm-hmm. you know, and and like the microphones on a like modern smartphone are pretty good. Like you can get pretty good audio from that, you know, and it's not the same as a really great mic in their mouth, but like it's free for them to just record themselves. And nine times out of 10, it sounds totally fine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so for recording phone calls and things like that, you do the kind of double ender thing like yeah the, t- the sort of self tape sync yeah yeah um have you messed around with things like ringer or whatever i don't even know if ringer is still around zencaster yeah i yeah. don't do that you know i i do a very basic like call the person either on the landline or on zoom or skype and then just ask them to record themselves on their smartphone and like sync them up later and then of course i record my side and that's kind of been the easiest way for me to do things and you know every so often you get someone who doesn't want to or doesn't you know like can't figure it out but 99 percent of the time that works totally fine and again like I try not to overthink it you know like as you know when you're making a show by yourself like you kind of have to figure out which parts of the process you're going to really commit your time to and which parts you're just going to kind of like let be the minimum viable product kind of like whatever is good enough is good enough and that's kind of my mo on on the recording of of the voices and i spend a lot of time thinking about the structure of the show and the scripting and all this other stuff and who to interview and the questions i ask and cutting it all together i don't spend a lot of my time trying to really stress out about the sound quality being you know it's 90 percent of the way there that that last 10 percent just doesn't i don't think it makes the show better enough to commit like a ton of resources into it mm-hmm. one of the th- kind of joys of the show is that it does have a you know there's a lot of variety within episodes and between episodes so in sort of de- how, thinking about how your show has developed like are there things that you've sort of learned along the way about how to structure it and put it together and stuff sure yeah i mean like i said that first season i think i was still really sort of like testing what the show was right you know we had this concept which was let's talk about the future and let's kind of blend audio drama and reporting and try to kind of take on a future each episode and kind of see where we can go with that. And that was kind of the brief, basically, the the, the pitch as it started. Um, and I didn't really have any kind of like loftier thoughts about what the show was trying to do sort of philosophically or, you know, what I hoped the listeners got out of it. It was really just kind of like, this seems like a fun, interesting concept and let's kind of see where it goes. Um, since then, I have kind of formulated a much bigger, broader thesis around like why I'm doing this, what I hope the project kind of achieves in the world, like why I'm putting it out there, which I think makes sense because if you're going to spend five years of your life working on something, you know, you kind of want to know why. (laughs) Um, And, you know, that first season, you know, I think was really helpful in figuring out some of those things. 
So now sort of what I talk about when I talk about the point of the show or sort of what I am doing with this project is that I really believe that it's helpful to show people a couple of things about the future. And the first one is that it hasn't happened yet, which is very obvious when you say it, but sometimes feels like it's worth thinking about because sometimes I think it can feel as though the future is sort of predetermined and set and there's nothing you or I can do about it and we're sort of on this track and, you know, the planet is burning and these mega companies are just getting richer and like there's nothing that you and I can really do about it. So like, why bother? And so the main point of the show is, A, that's not true. B, you know, there are things that you and I can do to make a better future and see that, you know, even the act of imagining the future is actually really helpful and, and sort of good for both you personally and the world, right? There are research studies um, around the ways in which imagining the future, they call it mental time travel in the psychology research, um, is actually really beneficial for your mental health. Um, it's people who are depressed have a really hard time doing that, right? Imagining what the future might be like. Um, there are some really interesting studies that suggest that the more you sort of practice this, the sort of happier you'll be, the more prepared you'll feel for when things inevitably happen, which, you know, bad things happen. That's sort of how the world works. Um, and so the show is kind of trying to equip people with the tools and the context and kind of the information they might need to go out and imagine better futures, make those futures happen, and just feel a little bit more prepared around sort of this like wild, weird thing that is the future, whatever that means. Um, and that is sort of a, an idea that I've come to over time. And so now when I think about like what makes an episode of the show, a lot of the time it's like, it needs to answer questions for people. It needs to help people understand their place in the future. Um, the first season, I didn't really talk very much about what a listener could do or what their role might be in these futures. It was more just sort of exploring, you know, how likely is this? What would it be like? Um, and now I'm a lot more explicit sort of saying like, hey, you know, here's where you fit in or here's where you might want to do something or here's a place where you can actually kind of make some difference. I try to kind of do that in each episode. I also learned, I think, too, just sort of what the scope of a flash forward episode generally should be. Um, I get one of the most commonly requested episodes is one that I sort of tried to do in the first season. And I think it taught me a little bit about scope for each episode because um, it's really hard to take you. It's, well, I'll say it's very easy to bite off more than I can chew, maybe, um, with some of these topics. So one of the most commonly requested episodes is A Future Without Borders, which is really interesting. And I'm genuinely super interested in that idea. The question is sort of like, how do I tackle that in a way that is not just like a nine hour episode about borders? Because, you know, the impact of A Future Without Borders will be different at every border. And so how do I kind of like think about you know, narrowing that down into a future, right? Like what, what that means. And so I've learned that the sort of ideal future, the ideal episode is sort of formulated as a sentence, which is a future in which blank, and the blank has to be a pretty specific thing, um, whether it's a technology or a social change or a law or, a, you know, a specific thing has happened that has set something into motion. Um, and not to be too, it's tempting sometimes to be like, what's the future of gender? But that's like, you know, that's huge. It's a huge question. And so if I wanted to take on a question around gender, then, you know, maybe the question is a future in which you can swap bodies with anybody at any time, right? And like, maybe that's a way to get at questions of gender. There has to be something a little bit more specific in order for the show to kind of like work or for an episode to work. And that's something I learned as I was producing it. I've definitely made a couple of episodes that fit off a little bit more than I could chew. I will say that the requirement or the way the show is structured, having that scene at the top is kind of a nice guardrail on that because in order to write a scene, you need something specific to have happened. <laughs> um, so, you know, you're not just going to have like your character standing around being like, ah, let's talk about gender. Like they have to, they have to be responding to something or, you know, like doing something. So it kind of helps me a little bit in terms of making sure that I'm sticking to something that I can write a scene for. Um, but yeah, it, that's sort of one of the big things that I've learned is that make the more, the most satisfying episodes tend to be really specific where they're like, this very specific thing has happened. And then the fun thing of the episode is the ripple effect out that you didn't even expect or you didn't see coming. Um, it's sort of fun to go small to big. If you go big, it's really hard to go small again when you're talking about some of these future questions. Yeah, I mean, I was trying to think what 
the you know that beginning vignette or whatever would would even be for a world without borders like what is the story i mean it's there? one that yeah that's one i really do want to do a because it's so commonly requested it's probably the most commonly requested one it's that one and a future without money are the two that people ask about a lot um and they're both really interesting and i would love to figure out a way to do it but i almost feel like it would have to be like a five part series where it would be like the future without borders in the united states a future without borders in asia you know there's like so many places there are so many borders that are so hotly contested in so many different ways that I wouldn't want to kind of collapse it down into something that's too simplistic um so maybe that's what I should do is just do a series but I I haven't figured it out yet I'm still thinking about it yeah and I I know that I mean you've kind of found that series is, can be kind of a tricky thing as well Yes. Yeah. It's hard to make a series. Yeah. It's hard. I mean, I think lots of people um, I've talked to have ha had a hard time making series, and that was no exception for me. I enjoyed making it, but um, I enjoyed yeah, listening to, to it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting. They were, I did. So, for the listeners who don't know what we're talking about, last year I did um, four mini seasons of five episodes each, and they were each around a theme. And some of the themes were more literal than others so one was about earth and most of those were climate change related one was about power one was about crime so these sort of like ideas around those one was about bodies and so some of them were really specific bodies right the future of the body five different ways to think about that and then you know power is like this sort of bigger picture question so we talked about literal power like fusion we talked about political power we talked about sort of the power of you know lobbyists etc cetera, etc cetera. um and they were really fun to make, and I'm I'm very proud of them. But it's can be, in my experience, um, hard to explain, especially to new listeners, like who want to drop in and they're like, "What is going on? <laughs> like, what are these episodes? The schedule is all weird because it was five weekly and then a break and then five weekly and then a break." And so it just was hard to kind of promote and get retain listeners on on those. I found um, I know that I've talked to a couple of other people who run sort of small boutique podcast companies and they have actually told me also that they have found it really hard to sell limited run series um to even like spotify or the big the big publishers and stuff like that mm -hmm. um not to get back to nuts and bolts again but uh do you i know i believe you use pro tools to edit right mm -hmm. that's correct yeah is that what you've used from the beginning that's what I learned on, and so that's what I use. I, you know, I don't necessarily recommend Pro Tools for someone who's like starting out, has never edited audio before. You know, like most people don't actually need Pro Tools, especially if you're doing like a more of a chat style show where there's only going to be, you know, you and your guest, and maybe like an intro and outro that you record. There's no reason for you to be using Pro Tools for that. To be perfectly honest, like you know. It's not that, that you don't you're not mixing a Kanye album you know you don't need 96 tracks right like um or any of the sort of processing and stuff I find it useful in part because I learned on it and so you know relearning software is annoying um but also you know because I'm doing this audio drama stuff and I do a little bit of my own scoring it's helpful to kind of have a little bit more power but if I were advising someone who was just starting out and had never touched an audio editing software of any kind I'd probably recommend something like Hindenburg that's pretty user-friendly has a lot of that powerful stuff if you really want to dig into it but also just sort of is like clean and easy to use Hindenburg is um, designed for journalists it's designed for people who are doing more of like a newsy style a couple of tracks you know ins and outs that kind of thing um, and it's pretty affordable compared to Pro Tools which is like ridiculous um, in terms of money but I'm, I'm in too deep now I can't go back <laughs> <laughs> sunk costs I know I know it's tough. horrible <laughs> Um, you mentioned that you, uh, that you write some of the music, um, is that, how did you get, put, how did you get together your theme music and Yeah, I like just that? started working on learning how to write music. So most of the time, theme, the theme music that you hear on Flash Forward either is something that I remixed, um, sort of with a couple of, I remixed in Pro Tools using a couple of sort of free um, open source public access sort of creative commons tracks that I will sometimes cut together into like a weird little montage -y, you know, remix 
track. But the um, flash forward music comes from one of the, the en- intro song is just Creative Commons public um, song. And the outro is by this band, um, it's really one person named Hustlonia, who is this really cool musician who I actually interviewed for an episode. And I just love his work. He's got this like really weird, cool style and vibe. And so I asked if um, he actually wrote a whole original score for a live show that I did. And I asked if I could use one of the songs from that live show for the outro music for um, flash forward and for advice for and from the future I commissioned an original song from um, a band called Also 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 um, who actually has a new album out which you can get on Bandcamp um, and they're awesome and um, they're just like a great indie band so you know I have I feel like at this point I have some capital built up you know a little bit of money in the bank for flash forward and so if I'm going to do a song, like ask for a song. I feel like paying indie musicians is something that I feel really good about, even if it's not that much money (laughs) in the grand scheme of things. Um, So yeah, I I feel like I'm now happy to kind of commission music from folks. And then I am learning very slowly um, (laughs) how to do some of my own music that isn't just like very messy mashups of tracks, you know, with some weird effects put on top. And the art for the, you have art for the show as a whole but then also each individual episode Mm -hmm. has its own art yeah yeah those are all done so the logo for the show is by lena groger who's a dear friend of mine who works at propublica actually and is just like an amazing investigative journalist and also really good designer like which is sort of amazing and then each episode for flash forward has an original illustration done by matt lubchansky who is incredible i love their work they're amazing. And they also help run The Nib, which is an amazing sort of comics collection. And they have their own kind of long running web comic. So absolutely go check out their work. Matt Lubchansky, they're the best. Um, and I've been working with them for so long that also they kind of they get the show so well. They know the show so well that I mean, I never give notes. They just send me their they send the art and I'm like, yes, that's that's perfect. <laughs> you know, they just um, they're great. And they're working with me um, on the book, the Flash Forward book as well, which is coming out next year. Um, and so it's just a, a total dream to work with them. They're amazing. So you you talked a little bit about paying musicians and stuff. And uh, do you pay guests as well? I do not pay guests. So um, in journalism school, you learn that that is like a very big no-no. That you don't pay guests to be on. You don't pay for interviews. Um, oh. Some people have different feelings about that. Um, it makes there. This is one of those journalism rules that I think makes a lot of sense if you are a, like a political reporter and like you're not going to pay a congressperson to talk to you, obviously. Um, nor are you going to pay someone who you know. I would never pay a tech worker who I wanted to talk to about Facebook. Like I wouldn't pay somebody who works at Facebook to talk to me. Like that just wouldn't make any sense. Or a press person. Um, so mm-hmm. in in sort of like journalism land, paying for access is kind of a big taboo thing. Um, and I do think of Flash Forward as a journalistic show. Um, you know, I am reporting. I am, you know, I am asking people for their time. And I, I think I am less. There are some journalists who are like hard line. You should never do this. If you ever pay anybody for their time, like that is like a fireable offense. Um, at me- most newspapers, you you would be fired if you did that. Um, sure. I feel like I absolutely kind of understand the argument for, you know, you're asking someone for their time, you're asking someone for their expertise. You know, I think it kind of depends on what the kind of call is. If it's sort of like in the context of consulting, where it's like you're asking them to give you advice about something, or if you're asking them for X, Y, or Z thing. I mostly interview scientists who, you know, really are excited about getting their work out there. Um, Most of those scientists are publicly funded. Um, And so, you know, to me, some of it is like, you know, taxpayers, pay for this research and should probably know about it. Um, but yeah, I, I, it's, it's, it's a really tricky topic that actually is um, very controversial. And if you bring it up around journalists, a lot of them will just be like, oh, no, of course, you could ne- like you should never, ever, ever pay. And I, I, like, I get why some people won't talk to journalists unless they're being paid. TV is a little different. Um, a lot of people who like, work in TV will pay for access. And also, this is very US specific. So if you go to the UK paying for 
interviews is totally normal, which I did not know. Um, and I went, I did, I reported a, um, an audio documentary for ESPN and I, it was about a bunch of women who live in the UK. And, um, I learned on the job that they mostly expected to be paid. And I was like, oh no, I would get fired if I did that. Like, it's just like a different cultural thing. So it's an American journalism norm that you don't don't do that. So I do not do that. I do pay the voice actors who work. Um, if they're if I hire a professional voice actor to be in on the show, I pay them obviously, but I do not pay for interviews. Um, one of the things that I've seen you post on Twitter and elsewhere about quite a bit is the need to make your like guest lists uh, and sources inclusive in various ways. Um, has that been a was that a priority from the beginning, or did that develop over time? Yeah. I don't think it was a conscious priority from the beginning. Um, I think in general, I've always been very aware of the disparity, especially in science, on who gets the mic and who doesn't get the mic, um, whether that's hosting shows or being on the interview side of shows. Um, the first season, I didn't think very deeply about it, but um, after that, after the first season, I started tracking um, source diversity in a very imprecise way, right? There's many vectors on which people may or may not sort of identify as or be a part of an underrepresented community in science. Um, I'm not going to like start an interview asking people prying personal questions about, you know, their sexual orientation or their gender or, you know, their like, are you disabled? Like if it's not relevant to the conversation at hand, it's sort of like, you know, so it's imprecise. Um, but I did start tracking this during the second season. And starting in the third season, I started making goals for myself because I had sort of had this idea that, oh, I'm good at this. Like, I'm aware I'm, I'm doing a good job. Um, but it's one of those things where you often think that you're better at it than you actually are. So, you know, I've the show has always been very good at gender diversity, um, at least sort of um, it's always been mostly women or non-binary people and you know men have been usually it's like 60 40 you know women and non-binary people and then you know to men um but on the on the sort of racial diversity side i thought i was doing great and i wasn't doing that great <laughs> um and so i started making goals started really tracking and started thinking a lot more about how do i make sure that I am hitting my goal. And I will say my goal for the show is 50% sources of color. Um, and that's pretty high for most shows, I think, in general. But um, it sort of feels like the right number to me. It's not scientifically determined. I just was like, half. Half would be good, you know? Um, and so that's kind of the goal that I've been working towards. Um, and I'm currently, for this season, at about 40%. Um, but I have a bunch of episodes coming up that um, are pretty much all people of color. So, um that's the goal for this year. Yeah. And uh, just to take an example from your show of why that can be important. Um, it's kind of amazing. Like I can sort of imagine that if I were doing a show like yours and I did uh, an episode on, uh, you know, that involves disability of some kind. Um, one of the things that you discovered is that a lot of the people who have like come up with inventions related to, you know, replacing wheelchairs or prosthetics or whatever uh have not asked any disabled people themselves whether they want that right. um, and then the result <laughs> is that often they end up with a thing that people don't actually want yeah yeah i mean i think this is way more common than you would think um it seems obvious i think to many of us that like of course if you're going to invent something for a community you might in at bare minimum, ask the community if they want it. And probably what you should do is involve them in the inventing process. Um, that does not happen. And I think it doesn't happen not because they, a lot of these engineers or inventors are malicious in any way or are sort of intentionally excluding. You know, the episode that comes to mind for me is um, the one about exoskeletons, where I talked to a guy who is inventing an exoskeleton. And turns out his brother actually is, in, in his mind, he was inventing this for his brother, right? His brother has motor issues and, you know, he thought this would be great. Um, he won't have to use a wheelchair anymore. He'll be able to use his exoskeleton. Um, and then, you know, we called up the brother 
And it turned out that the brother doesn't want an exoskeleton. And I mean, this is his own brother who he loves and cares about and has committed a lot of his work life to, you know, in theory, help. And he didn't even ask him, you know, Um, I think it's just, you know, you're not trained to in many engineering classes and engineering programs. It's not a thing that, you know, is brought up to you as something to do. Um, There's a lot of assumptions, I think, that people make around what is obviously good or is obviously something that people will want. Um, And so, yeah, I like to try and kind of remind people that, A, you should talk to disabled folks, but also that disabled folks are not a monolith, right? Like some people might want that and some people might not. And that's totally normal and fine. Um, I think that's one of the reasons I try to have a lot of disabled people on the show is that, A, a lot of the future doesn't talk about them. And so thinking about, you know, folks like that, in the show, but also to like display a variety of opinions, right? Like some people are stoked about CRISPR and some people are like, get, do not talk to me about it. I don't want to talk about it. So it's, you know, like anything, it's more complicated than uh, people sort of portray it as. Yeah. One of the reasons I wanted to talk to you is because, you know, you do interviews, you do the audio dramas, you do the monologues, scripted, you know, scripted monologues, um, which sort of, crosses over with a lot of different kinds of podcasts, right? So do you have, do you approach those differently? That's interesting. I don't approach them that differently. Um, You know, I kind of, I guess I sort of take them each as they come. Um, The process of making the show usually starts with figuring out the topic, obviously, and like doing a bunch of research and reading. I try to do at least one interview before I script the scene, just because a lot of the time in the interview, stuff will come up where I'm like, oh, that's interesting, or like, oh, I didn't think of that. And so if I can inject that into the scene, it feels both sort of like cool that it's there's synergy between the interview and the scene, but also it makes the scene slightly more interesting. So I try to do at least one interview before I script anything. And then I sort of, you know, put on my imagination hat and like script these scenes. And I usually will script a couple and then pick one, you know, because sometimes so, you know, the scenes are always different. Sometimes it's, you know, a museum tour and sometimes it's, you know, a conversation between people. And so they're always really different. Um, But I try to kind of come up with a couple of different ways into that future and see which one sort of feels the most interesting or sort of feels the most satisfying for a listener sometimes I'll do more than one every so often if I like can't pick I'll do more than one but um and then I kind of send those out to voice actors or you know sometimes patrons or people I've worked with in the past and who love doing voices for the show I'll send them out and while that while they're sort of recording then I sort of produce the rest of the show and then the audio drama kind of comes together at the very end um that's kind of one of the last things that I actually like put together, assemble, score, kind of like mix, do do all that. So that's kind of the process. They're both like different, obviously, because, you know, one of them is interviews and then I'm sort of doing a lot more like I talk, you talk, I talk, you talk, kind of cutting everything together, trying to describe stuff, explain things, narrate, fact check, etc. Um, and then the other side is the more creative kind of like getting weird with it. Um, but they're also sort of similar. I don't want them to feel, I think... What I, what I want with the show is for them to not feel like they're totally separate, that there's like this one thing over here and then this like completely other thing over here. I do kind of want it to feel like some synergy and of a piece and not like this big clear break between them. Um, I, I have experimented a little bit with like maybe doing a scene at the top and then a scene somewhere in the middle too to kind of like bring you back into the future. Um but I haven't, I haven't quite figured out a way to do that that like feels right or isn't confusing or whatever. But I've, I've, I have some plans for some interesting future episodes that are a little bit more woven together than kind of the current top and bottom. Yeah, I feel like we've talked a, a bit about sort of conventional wisdom and how it may or may not be based on a whole lot. Um, are there any other kind of pieces of of advice that you see being given that you maybe would push back on somewhat? Hmm. I mean, I would say there's no such thing as a good radio voice. That's one thing. I think sometimes, and I think this is less the case now, um, now that there are so many more podcasts and so many more people kind of like entering into the field. But I think there is still sometimes this idea that certain voices sound good and certain voices don't sound good and that's bullshit, right? Like everyone's voice is 
valid in this world. And that's a great gatekeeping way to kind of like only have people who talk in a very specific way that like generally comes with privilege and capital and all of those things. Um, the other thing I will say is that I am very tired of people complaining that there are too many podcasts. Mm. I just feel like, I don't know, like if don't listen to shows you don't want to listen to. Like no one is holding a gun to your head and being like, you have to listen to this new show. Like it's fine. Like let people make their shows. It just feels like a lot of, um, it feels like a fun sort of like snarky thing to say. And I've, I've made these jokes myself. Like, you know, I am throwing stones in the glass house here, but, um, but I just like, no one is like, oh, and I guess some people do sometimes say like, there's too many TV shows, but like, you just find the ones you like, you know, and, and also it's another way to sort of exclude people who maybe weren't traditionally welcomed in and now are being told, well, there's too many podcasts. So like, don't, don't bother. Um, so I think, yeah, I, I would say like, everyone should just make their show. And I think the thing that I would advise is really game out, you know, what you're going to do. I see so many people diving into a show where they have maybe two episodes planned and then they think they're just going to like figure it out from there. And uh, I think having an actual plan is really helpful. Um, like you should be able to, if you're going to start a podcast that you in theory want to continue on for an, in, you know, some amount of time, it doesn't have to go on forever, but for some amount of time, we're not all car talk or we're just like, in, you know, living on from beyond the grave in, you know, radio stations everywhere. But you should have you should be able to write down at least 10 episodes, in my opinion. Like if, if the show has legs and you really think like I could do this, even if it's like 10 of your friends who you think you could convince to come on your show, like that's fine. But you should be able to write down 10. And if you cannot write down 10, then like maybe you don't have a podcast idea. And that's fine. I have so many bad podcast ideas that are not I could not write down 10 episodes for. Um, and you don't have to do those 10 episodes when you actually make the show. You just have to be able to like actually think out what your show is going to be um, and sort of like why it's going to be interesting to people. Why is it different from the other shows that might be out there? You know, no one is saying that you can't make another show in which two people watch a bad movie and make jokes about the bad movie. There are probably a thousand of those podcasts out there, if not more. You could make one, but just start thinking about why is yours better than the other ones out there? Is it because you're genuinely funnier than most people? Maybe that's true. Is it because you're going to kind of like actually bring in some new element that these other shows don't have? You know, I think just like thinking through what you're doing and why you're doing it and sort of what the value add is to kind of use like annoying jargon. Um that's helpful. And listen to what else is out there. Like if you don't listen to any shows like the show that you are going to make, you should probably go do that before you go make your show because you just don't like it's helpful to know even if you hate all the other shows out there. Maybe that's great because then you're like all these other shows suck and mine's gonna be better for this reason. Um, you should just know kind of like what the landscape looks like if you're going to make a show like that. And the last thing I'll say is like don't sign your IP away for like a very small amount of money. Um, there are, I mean, there have been so many conversations recently around podcasting on people who have pitched their shows to big networks like Gimlet, or Spotify, or whatever, and the shows get made and they get popular and then the creators don't own any of it. Um, your intellectual property, your IP, your brain, your stuff that you make is the most valuable thing that you have. And it sometimes might make sense to make a deal with a big company to have them own it. Um, that might make sense for you. But like, don't, that's not the only way to do this, I think is what I would say. Like you could, you can also leverage other elements and pull other levers and maybe license or maybe do other things where you still retain ownership and then you can write your book about it or you can option your TV show about it if that's what you want to do or whatever it is you want to be doing. Um, just being more, a little bit more careful, read the contract before you sign it, probably have a lawyer look at it if you can, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing I think is, um. I see a lot of people rushing to like try and sell their idea and maybe that's right for you, but maybe you should just own it because you came up with it and you are the talent and you're the person who's making it. Um, that was kind of rambly, but those are some things I would say. <laughs> no, that was great. Um, are there any other things that we should talk about that we haven't brought up yet? I don't know. What are you listening to right now that you think is great? I feel like I need to find new things to try that no one else is listening to. Uh, oh boy. Uh, um, I recently started editing a podcast called Keeping Track, which is... Ooh, tell me about it. Um, it's hosted by three Olympic runners. Cool. 
yeah and so they like sort of just talk about what's going on in the world of running and track uh at, at the olympic level wow. um and you know i started editing it just after um the ahmed arbery mm. thing sort of made the national news again and so there's been a lot of interesting discussions of yeah i was gonna say race i guess race all the time but in particular right. race yeah. and race yeah yeah, yeah. precisely um, right. So that's yeah. been interesting. That's interesting. It's called Keeping Track? Yeah. Huh. I'll check that out. Oh, I, I know what I wanted to ask yeah. you. Go for um, it. Another kind of nuts and boltsy type question. Sure. Like, how long does it take you to edit, like, you know, 20 minutes of audio or whatever? Yeah, a long time. Yeah. It, may, it takes me about 80 hours to make an episode of the show. That includes, like, research and stuff? Or yeah, just... yeah, yeah. And that's like an average. Some episodes, if it's on something that I know a lot about and I can call sources, you know, there are a couple topics that I have reported on enough that I can just kind of like shoot off a couple emails and get people on the show and get it done. But um, in other episodes, it's like, you know, 100 hours or more because I'm like reading five books and like trying to kind of like wrap my head around something I don't know anything about. So um, that's kind of the general zone. People ask that a lot. Like, how long does the show take? Um, in terms of actual editing, I'm pretty fast at editing. Um, I will say I am now hiring an editor, a, an associate producer, to edit uh, the show because I am fast at it, but I also like don't really need to be spending my time like cutting, doing rough cuts and stuff like that at this point. I have a lot of other projects I'm trying to work on, and um, you know I can finally pay someone to do that. Uh, so I'm excited about that. Um, and um, so yeah, but um, but yeah, I mean. Editing is something that, um, you know, just actually cutting tape. I Because I've been doing it for so long at this point in Pro Tools, I'm, like, pretty speedy at it. Um, how much is editing a 20-minute chunk of tape? If I'm just – if I have – if I already have the script done, um, I basically – my process is I, I – run all of my interviews through a transcription service called Trent. Um, and so it's sort of an automated transcription. So it's machine learning, transcribing. So it's sometimes really good and sometimes not so good, <laughs> depending on accents and how the tape sounds and stuff. But um, And then I'll listen through that. I'll pull the tape that I know I want um, into a script. I'll write the script. And then I'll go through and pull the actual tape in, in Pro Tools into the timeline. Um, and then I will go through the script again, make sure it sounds good. And then I'll record that. And then, so it's sort of like lots of stages of, of production. Um, it's interesting. I'm doing a, um, a business accelerator course right now, which is actually great. Um, business is something that I am not, it's not my main skill set. Uh, I think that's probably true of many podcasters. <laughs> um, and so I'm doing a, um, a program. And one of the things they wanted us to do was sort of film ourselves, you know, doing stuff so that they can promote the program. It's sort of a beta tested program right now. Um, and they were like, oh, just film yourself, you know, recording the podcast. And I was like, it's not really like, it's not like there's not one moment where I sit down and like record the podcast. You know, it happens all day every day I'm in I have a little booth in my that I've made in my house that's just a corner of our house that has Ikea curtains and some foam that I bought on the internet that is glued to a board that I got at a salvage yard so it's probably like $75 total you know to create my little uh recording studio um and so like it's sort of there's lots of pieces and lots of moving elements that kind of go into it um but, uh, but yeah, it, it, 20 minutes of audio probably takes me just to, if I already have all the script done and I've already all the tape in sort of the timeline, it probably takes me an hour and a half to kind of like get it into a place that, I, that I'm that i happy with. And you mentioned transcripts. Um, mm -hmm. You provide a transcript for all of your shows. Yeah. Uh, for, you know, that people can, anyone who wants to can access. Yeah. Um, and so uh, that's another thing that I've seen you sort of, post and and talk about how yeah. you feel like that's important so this is here's your platform you know <laughs> sure yeah yeah so um i think transcripts are really important i in my opinion um for a couple of reasons uh on the business side it's great seo right so people complain that it's really hard to search for podcasts because you can't search for like you heard it on a podcast and then you're like trying to search for it but of course it's just an audio file and google at this point is not on mass transcribing audio files. I think there's probably starting to in certain situations. But um, so it's good for your business anyway, 
if you don't care, even if even beyond the like, it's good for people, it's good for your business um, to do that. Um, it's also good for people because a lot of people would really love to engage with podcasts, but don't process information orally very well or can't hear. And they really want to know what you're doing and what you have to say. And they would love a transcript. Um, this is something that I think is, it makes your show much more accessible to people. Um, it gives people an opportunity too, that even if they do listen, but maybe they don't, you know, their brains are wired in a way that like retaining audio information is not something that they are really, really great at, they can go back and look and say like, what was that thing that they talked about? Or I want to kind of go back and look. Um, There's so many reasons to put a transcript out there. Um, It is more work. It is a little bit extra work, um, especially if you have a show that is something like, you know, a live role playing game show where like it's not scripted. You know, my transcripts are pretty easy to put up because everything is very scripted and I know exactly what I'm going to say. And I listen to the show a million times before it goes up. So it's pretty easy for me to make a transcript. Um, It's pretty fast um, because I'm already kind of working from one. I get that if you're making a show that's like two hours of live gameplay, that's hard. Um, You're going to have to spend some money, you know, transcribing it. But I do think it's worth trying to figure out how to work that into your workflow just because there are so many people who would love to engage with your content um, and love to hear what you have to say, but don't actually want to hear it in their ears for whatever reason, either because they can't or because, you know, their brains, some of us, our brains are different. Everybody has different brains. Um, everyone is configured slightly differently. So giving people a way to, to find you and to, to see your stuff, I think that's only, it's a win-win. Yeah. I've, I've also, I also understand that, uh, you know, people who are English as a second language right, exactly. will find that helpful. And um, someone who is hearing uh, impaired wrote to me once about a podcast I don't do anymore. Uh, but she one of the things she explained to me is like that people who are hearing impaired are really used to transcripts that are bad bad yeah. quality <laughs> and they they can you know obviously it's better to have a good one but they're used to it they can deal with it and it's better to have a bad bad transcript than than none at all so totally yeah yeah and i think some people get um caught up in like, oh, I have a hundred back catalog episodes. Like, how can I transcribe them? And like, yes, it takes a while, whatever, but start doing it. Just start doing it with your current ones. And then you can, you know, you can figure out your back catalog. It's always better to do a little bit than to do nothing than to do nothing at all, right? Um, and, you know, if you, YouTube auto transcribes. Um, so if you're already uploading your content to YouTube, which some podcasters do, you know, you can then download that transcript and start from there if you want to. You know, there's a lot of ways that you can do this that are relatively inexpensive. Um, some of these uh, like automatic transcription services, relatively inexpensive. You could get a quick and dirty transcript and throw that up there if you don't have the time or means to get one that's sort of really good. Um, but also, you know, I think of it to go back to the point about wanting to hire people and pay people for their time, there are people who are professional transcribers who would love to do this for you for a dollar a minute of final audio or something like that. And so you could be sort of like supporting another often creative person who's sort of trying to kind of make ends meet. So if you have the means to do that, I think it's like a nice way to kind of cultivate community in the podcast space. Agreed. Um, All right. I think I've this time, I think I've actually remembered everything I wanted to ask you about. Um, do you have any final words or where can people find your stuff? Yeah. Um, so you can find Flash Forward uh, and advice for and from the future on any podcasting app. Flash Forward sort of the older, more mature show, perhaps, um, that started in 2015. Advice for and from the future is a new show that I just started a couple of weeks ago. There are now two episodes up. Um, and that one is sort of a bit more of an experiment. It's um, sort of what it sounds like. It's an advice show about the future. Some of the questions are real questions from today. Some of the questions are fake questions from tomorrow. Um, and it kind of does a similar thing where it's blending interviews with experts with sort of weird audio drama theory, old sounds, lots of sort of surprising stuff. So I'm having a really good time <laughs> with that one. Um, it's new. Uh, and so it's kind of fun to be able to try new stuff. You know, Flash Forward has a pretty specific cadence and set of way of thinking about things, which is very fun and weird on its own. But this kind of lets me do something different, which is kind of nice. Um, so yeah, you can find either of those wherever you find your podcasts. Um, 
I'm Rose Evelith. I'm the only Rose Evelith in the world. So <laughs> for better or for worse, if you Google me, you will find me. <laughs> so <laughs> you can find me on all the all the social media sites. Unfortunately, I am on all of them. So <laughs> you can find me that way. My condolences. Um, yeah, it's horrible. <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much for talking to me and uh, to anyone who's watching this. Um, Thanks for having me. This is fun.